Business of Architecture, episode 308. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I am your host, Enix Sears, and today's episode is a continuation of last week's episode where we're going to be going over the hate mail. So if you have any hate mail that you want to send us, please send it in to support at businessofarchitecture.com, and you might just find yourself a star right here on the show. Without further ado, here is today's episode. Hello, Architect Nation. Welcome back. This is part two of my of our unscripted conversation. Ryan Willard here joining me. Hi, how's it going? Ryan here. Ryan uh, recently just finished an interview with someone on Money Scripts. And first of all, what are Money Scripts? They are the deep-rooted psychological stories and beliefs that define our relationship to money and how we interact with it, how we go about earning it and how much we make of it. And they're kind of, in many cases, hidden from view. We're not conscious of them, but we're living deeply inside of them and they manifest in all sorts of different ways, but they ultimately are the things that define that relationship we have with money and how much we make. And scripts can be compared to an operating system yeah. of a computer. Yeah. And so just like when I pull open my Mac here and I'm looking at it, I'm not seeing the ones and the zeros. I'm not seeing all the computations that are happening in the background, but I couldn't just take any old program like off my Android phone and stick it on the Mac computer. It's not going to work. And so everything that gets put onto the Mac needs to be compatible with the Mac OS system that I'm running. So we have an operating system. Our beliefs, our values, the way we view the world, and this determines... What we do, and what we do, of course, determines our actions, and of course, our actions determine what happens this week, what happens this week, determines what happens this month, what happens this month, determines what happens this year, what happens over the years, determines our destiny, and ultimately our life. So this is where this concept of scripts came into it, because it really is kind of one of the key things or levers in our life we can use to change the results we're getting, right? And as as Ryan was saying, scripts are interesting in the fact that they make themselves manifest through the results that we bring into our lives. And so this comes to this thing of, of hate mail, right, Ryan? So we're going to yeah. talk, we're going to talk about, uh, in this particular episode, we're talking about haters. And as we mentioned in the last episode, when you become a public figure, you start to get, you start to get hate mail, right, Ryan, <laughs> as, as we, as we are. We're talking about the throngs of people that are following us around today here in London. Yeah, very difficult to move anywhere on the tube. Yes. <laughs> just, being, just being recognized. Hey, you guys, you're business fuck. Yeah, yeah, we are. You know, I didn't think about it. I was thinking that was rush hour, but now that you come to speak no, of it, I, I'm sure all those people were there. They were there. They were flocking us. Oh, I was being followed. Avid podcast listeners. Yeah. Who, so d- despite, despite our, our meager following, we still managed to get some hate mail. And so I'm going to share here a message that was sent to me. So this is in response to a recent, and then Ryan and I will riff on this for a bit, kind of talk about this is interesting. Uh, But this was an email that I had sent out. And it was a little story I like to send out to my email list. I like to send out little parables, kind of just everyday stories that are kind of entertaining, that have some sort of parable or some thought that kind of, you know, inspire people for the day. And so this was a story from the author Simon Sinek, who wrote a wonderful, a couple of wonderful books, Start With Why, one of his best known books, New York Times bestselling author. But he really gets into the psychology of business. And so in this example, I'd heard a story about how he, and when I say I, it's actually my copywriter was the one that um, fleshed out this email for me. And talked about how he was running through um, running through Central Park, New York City, and he saw a cart of free bagels. Now, I don't know about you, but I love bagels, especially in New York. Some of the best bagels ever. So, Simon... Cream cheese and salmon. Oh, my so goodness. Good. Oh, avocado. Oh. So, he wanted a bagel, and um, yeah, he wanted a bagel, right? But he was running with a friend, and there was a long line, or a long queue, as they would say over here in London, a long queue of people waiting to get bagels. Now, mind you, these weren't bagels that were being sold right? There was no tickets or anything like that. But just out of common curi- common courtesy, people had decided to line up. Um, Simon decided to just walk up and reach to the crowd and just pick two bagels. So first of all, there wasn't, it wasn't like there was 
a shortage of bagels. That's the first thing <laughs> to realize here. There's no bagel famine. You know, it wasn't like he was stealing someone else's bagels. He just went up and he grabbed two of the free bagels, right? Everyone else was content to wait in the line. And so the, the lesson he was sharing here was that in every situation, because his friend said, I don't want to wait in the line. Right. And so Simon said, you know, it's interesting that when we look at any obstacle or thing that we want, there's many ways we can look at that situation. And we don't always have to follow the conventions. Right. So it's sort of about questioning conventions. And so he said that when he reached and grabbed the bagels, he didn't have a choice of which bagel. If he would have waited in line, he could have picked out the kind of bagel he wanted. But instead, he just, he was a trade off, right? He just wanted to get going. He wanted the bagel. So he just took the random chance, reached through, grabbed the bagels, and took off. No one minded, according to him. Now, I don't know the full story, but that's what he shared. Sounds legit to me, right? So I thought that's an interesting point. It's an interesting story about about getting what you want, about being able to look at situations and finding solutions that may not be apparent. And the point that he said here, he said, uh, if you're willing to think outside the box, as long as you're not stopping other people getting to their goal, you can have your bagel and eat it too. So the idea there is that in this particular situation, he didn't share anything about how he was stopping anyone else or impeding them from getting their goal, right? Yeah. So was, that, that's kind of the background on the story. It, well, yeah, it wasn't like he just sort of burst into the into a orderly queue <laughs> and you know you can't do that in the uk that would go mental oh, people would they'd, go, they'd just say american it just, must be an american oh, terrible terrible and yeah it's not like disneyland right it's not like it was at disneyland so anyways, yeah. let's go on here and see yeah. the the email so i got this email back from john john wright and john if you email me i'm gonna use your name <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> John John wrote back and I don't know sometimes I don't know if people are having a bad day or what it is but they say some very things over email and John writes dude that is the douchiest email ever <laughs> and I don't I don't see all the email that I get I have Ruth who's my concert she's my she's my concierge my my client concierge she's the one who gets all the email and then she sorts it and and brings stuff to my attention and so she told me about this email but she she re, she replied to him she said this is funny she said, she's so kind she said hi john appreciate the feedback exclamation <laughs> point <laughs> very sweet yes very, she's very very, very, very kind. professional very kind she said would you mind elaborating on why it came across as douchey was it it wasn't the intention at all so it's something to note thank you and of yeah. course this is something that i've trained her to do that any feedback we get we we take all the feedback and we want to look at it and we want to see if we are wrong about something we definitely want to know. But so John writes back and he says, um, okay, he's, <laughs> he says, cutting cutting line to get what you want is unethical. And is the I think you should read it. It sounds much better with a British accent. And you come around here, Ryan, that would sound it would sound better, I think, want, especially you, with what you, he's going to say my, here. Do you, what kind of British accent? Do you want, do you want my, my uh, like, estuary Kind of your refined. It's got to oh, be, refined. yeah, because this is a refined email. You don't want my London accent in. Yes, Okay. <clears throat> Cutting in line to get what you want is unethical and is the definition of what a douchebag would do to get ahead. It is what misbehaved children do before they understand the consequences of their actions. Donald Trump operates this way. If I see a girl I like, I just kiss her, <laughs> even <laughs> grab her p- we might have to edit. We might have to beep that one out. Okay. Some bagels and women's body parts are certainly not the same thing. And okay, maybe no one responded. But that's like saying I've robbed many people's homes and never been caught. So obviously it's fine. Then to somehow twist that logic into a marketing strategy and try to pawn it as business strategy just shows that your business of architecture doesn't mind being unethical, sounds like snake oil, and demonstrates the very low karmic threshold at which you are willing to operate, exist, and manifest. No thanks. So there's the email. Thank you, Ryan, for reading that. And But I have to admit it. I mean, it is... This is the first time someone's ever called me out about my low karmic threshold. I do it all the time, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Never so directly. But now that he says it, it does feel rather... I feel rather sad at the low karmic threshold that I'm operating. What, 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 what's interesting is that... Well, I mean, there's a lot of, there's just, there's a lot of stuff here about perception and how, how this has been viewed as being something unethical and i think a lot of architects and a lot of people view business altogether like we were talking about money scripts as being unethical 
And in order for you to get what you want, you've got to do something that somehow prevents other people from succeeding, that treads on other people, that is destructive, that is going to be uh, inhibitive to you know, good things happening in life and that you've got to be underhand and selfish in a way of doing it. And I think when that exists as a mindset, then it's very hard to do anything. That's how, that's how you're going to see the world. You will, that's, and it will be true for you. And so this, this, this is a great example of a money script. Now, I have money scripts. Ryan has – we all have money scripts. These are the, the way we perceive life. And obviously, John's writing here from his perspective of his script about what it means to be in business, about what it means to interface with other people, how to operate in the world. And so, yes, a great example of how a script makes – is kind of revealed through this, this wonderful kind email – that John t- t- <laughs> took time out of his day to share with me his feedback. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting as well because marketing and advertising, by its nature, is every act of marketing or advertising has an ethical quandary inbuilt into it because you're saying something to somebody else and then you're going to deliver on it or not deliver it. Now, architects have got to deal with this as well. As we say that we are going to be able to deliver you a building. And as we know, as architects, sometimes we don't communicate that to the client so well that they have a wildly different expectation of what it is that we said that we were going to deliver. And when those two expectations don't converge or are not aligned, then it causes relationship problems, people fall out, Um, architects might feel undervalued you're not getting paid enough Um, again there's a whole world of psychology going on here about perceiving what it means to get ahead or to build something so if it's okay let's let's kind of deconstruct what what john's saying here and we can't peer into john's mind we don't know and we're open to any clarifications that john would like to make about what he meant here but it would be interesting to see what we think he's communicating here maybe some of the scripts that he's operating on that caused him to write this email because obviously this is something he cares about very passionately. It's very touched a hot button for him uh, just because of the language here. And it's obviously very important to him. Now, I wrote back to him. Now, I've actually spoken to John on the phone, which so it was surprising to me that he would uh, kind of judge me so harshly. Uh, maybe some people find that a compliment. Maybe Donald Trump would say that's actually a compliment. He might say, well, thank you, dear kind sir. Um, but, you know, I, I just complimented John. I said, you know, John, I, I, I applaud your high moral values, which I do. I think that in general, architects, they take a very high moral road, which is awesome, which is great, which helps a lot. However, in the business world, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that it's almost like architects play by a different set of rules than everyone else. And these aren't legal rules. These are self-imposed, quote-unquote, air quotes, ethical rules. And as we were discussing before, these rules might not even be in the best interest of the clients. Yeah. Or what you're trying – or your mission. Or what you're trying – Your vision, your mission, exactly. Or what you're trying to accomplish as well. Like they might actually be uh, going against what you're standing for. Unknowingly, unknowingly sabotaging yourself exactly. and what you'd like to accomplish in the this, world. This happens a lot. I mean, um, in the book uh, we mentioned earlier, Rory Sutherland's Alchemy, he talks about, uh, you know, right wing, left wing politics, marketing for election campaigns. And he talks about how on the left, sometimes what happens is they're great ideals and they're great ideas and they're very noble and they could possibly be things, you know, like the redistribution of wealth, for example, is one idea that he talks about. I'll take some redistribution it, of wealth. And, and he talks about it in the sense that... As long as I'm on the receiving end, from, Ryan. From the socialist perspective, uh, it often, there's a kind of certain way to redistribute wealth. And yeah. people might think that people on the far right or the right are not interested in that idea, whereas studies have actually shown that in different contexts, um, people who are typically of a conservative persuasion are actually quite open to the idea of redistribution of wealth. And yeah, in the book he was talking about that often on the conservative side that they are very more willing to 
redistribute wealth by donations if they know where it's going to or there's a name that they can see what's happening to it and also things like um what's it the universal basic income so that as an idea that every human being gets a base wage uh, of like a thousand dollars or whatever it is most people are in line with that as being a great idea and being like okay if there's a way of making it work then that sounds like a good idea and it also leaves the space for competition as well so if you want more you can go out there and hustle and exactly exactly so there's that kind of reward system involved with your effort that's put in it's not just a complete you know it still incorporates that that variance for for people so the the point he was making in the book was that it's not black and white meaning that there's two sides to every story and it is interesting to kind of step into another person's shoes which going back to this email from john my perception of what john is saying here is that he is he has very strong ethical values one of which includes the idea of not cutting in line and he compares that to donald trump just doing whatever he wants because he wants to do it okay I, that, that okay i've got that i mean i just think the the compar- comparing um the the free bagel the incident free, the free bagel with like unconsensual whatever you want to grabbing call it, harassment harassing sex, sexual harassment yeah is like they're just so wildly different so wildly well interestingly different. they could be however in john's mind they're exactly the same which is interesting right he sees a similar thread between those two now i get it if you're talking about someone who's cutting in line at the expense of other people right maybe at disneyland like total disregard for other human beings and trying to get your own way yes this is something that we've seen donald trump do um and so i get that point however to jump to that conclusion from the email story that we read to me, that's that's a leap that I wouldn't have made. I wouldn't have drawn that connection because I, out of this parable, I got a different story, a story of empowerment, a story of looking at situations creatively. There was no law broken here. There was no bagel law. There was not even a conventional law because, again, um, no one was paying to be in line, right? So we kind of get into this gray area of like, okay, what's the, the ethical? And we don't have all the stories from Simon's story. Like, he didn't tell us all the details about that story. And so... Um, that's that's what I see here that John's kind of getting at is he's kind of drawing that line between cutting being unethi- unethical. Now, the ethics of telling another person that they have very low karmic threshold and they're selling snake oil, <laughs> there's probably another story there about that that we'd have to unpack. But maybe John wants to come on the podcast and explain what he meant by that. Well, and ag- again, there's, you know, the industry of advertising and marketing often gets tarnished with unethical behavior or just the nature of it there are lots of bad marketers there are lots of bad salespeople, people that lie and say that they're selling something and it doesn't do what it says that it's going to do um and the nature of marketing and, and sales is that there is always a risk involved with the person purchasing I mean, there's plenty of marketing agencies. There's plenty. I'm, I'm pretty sure Ogilvy have done a fair number of campaigns that have bombed, and that haven't. They've charged a huge fund for, and then they haven't delivered the results on it. Now there are lots of different ways of structuring your results, um, structuring how you get paid for results, um, structuring how you get paid for your services. Uh, that kind of can take on that kind of risk as well and i'm sure lots of these marketing agencies have all sorts of interesting uh ways of structuring their fees like for example we're we're gonna you know you're gonna charge we're gonna charge you x amount for the service and the production of this campaign and if it gets results then perhaps we get uh some sort of profit share involved in it and it really kind of we have to interrogate the question of like well what is what's fair how do we want to be creating these things and to have your own moral and ethical compass and to ensure that you're sticking to it and that you're being your word and you're doing what's right well said 
I mean, there's no way that I can compete with that svelte, beautiful <laughs> voice that Ryan Willard has. He makes me sound like a frog. Shall we move on to the next, yeah, uh, our yeah. next piece of interesting content yeah. here shared by one of our faithful fans? All right, so this is the next little comment here. This was posted as a comment on something I put up on LinkedIn. So I shared a little clip from a previous podcast, the interview I did with Blair Ends. Now, Blair talks a lot about this idea of value pricing. And so this post I put on LinkedIn, the, the headline of it, the title was, How to Price Your Next Architectural Service, Not What You Think. And so in this, in this particular post, uh, Blair Ends is talking about his philosophy on pricing. And so I'm just going to kind of read off what Blair said here. So Blair says, I'm just going to read off what, what he had quoted and said in this podcast. So he says, rule number one is to price the client, not the job. And so what that means is if a client or prospective client comes to you and says, what do you charge for X? You don't have an answer. Because if you have an answer, even if you have a narrow range, while well, we typically charge between X and Y, that means you are selling based on the inputs of time and materials. You're pricing on those two things. Or you're pricing based on market value in air quotes. In other words, competing you know, with what you generally charge for those things. So Blair says there's three things you can sell. Inputs, outputs, and outcomes are otherwise stated as value. And he's talking about his book. With the goal of his book is to get people to start to price based on the value that they communicate to the client. So if you're pricing based on value, then before you can set a price, you have to have a conversation with the client about and unearth what the value of this engagement would be to the client. And there's a methodology for that. And then he goes on. So that's kind of the crux of this post that was shared, right? That's rule number one, price the client, not the job. Now, Eric wrote as a comment here on my LinkedIn. He, I'm connected to him on LinkedIn. Uh, Eric said, for some reason, I find this an unethical method. Pricing the client, not the job. To me, it seems to be sending the message, how much can I get out of this guy versus some other client? And let's see, there's a couple of responses here. I wrote back, uh, I wrote back, um, interesting to bring ethics into it. This is negotiation, plain and simple. This is my perspective. This is a simple matter of negotiation, yeah. right? Clients certainly are pricing their architects. And so we were talking about this and you were, I mean, let, let's talk about the actual thing that's happening here, right? I mean, well, I, well, this is this is a conversation that's happened a lot in the industry where we're constantly talking as architects that we need to be communicating our value more. Our fees are low in general, and the reason is because we don't communicate. You know, we're not setting our fees as a result of the value that we're bringing to the project because we're not in a conversation with the client about that. So, you know, if you, for example, when I do a project in Belgravia that is a lot more value to the client because of the, well, there's more detail that's needed as a service because the building is more... And Belgravia is for people that aren't familiar with London real estate. Belgravia is like the most expensive bit of real estate in London. Um, so pro properties are kind of hyper, hyper priced there. And so they can be quite small. So a project, you know, of equal size that I might do in a suburb of London... Um, the client is going to be a very different kettle of fish. What's required from the project is going to be very different in terms of the amount of detail and information. But the value that's being brought to the project in Belgravia, monetarily, you know, what that expansion is going to do for the client is... Astronomically. It is, is just, just disproportionately different. So the price reflects that. Also... I would imagine that if you price a client in, you know, you see what happens. I'd like to hear what, what, people, what people do. If you price a client at a very low rate in one of these types of places, like, are they going to go, hmm, something's not right here? They, they smell something. Well, I mean, imagine, yeah, imagine that you told that client, yeah, it's, it's going to be a thousand pounds. Yeah. That's it, and I'd for your know, interior well, well, for your I'd, interior I'd, alteration. I'd, I'd get my I'd get into a lot of problems with that because I would have been undercharging, and it would just it would be very very difficult to deliver on that. And so there's a there's a different there's a different value, and also, you know, part of that communication is that this is a you know this building is a listed building. It's 
got heritage. We want to preserve it for a long period of time. We want it to keep. The family wants to keep it. So there's a different conversation where we're kind of really going into what's the value of the building over the course of its lifetime. Now, when, as architects, we are using our services for developers and investors, these guys are viewing the built environment pretty much purely as financial instruments. So as architects, we might find that idea kind of nauseating and uncomfortable and we don't like it. Um, it doesn't sit well with us. It kind of somehow it feels like it's in conflict with what we're trying to do is bring in great spaces to people and uh, having, you know, good functioning buildings. Well, actually, you'd be surprised at how many developers are interested in that. Um, but they also want to be able to understand that the people that are doing their project understand what their priorities are. And just that ability to be able to understand what their priorities are in terms of the financial performance of their projects, once that's been understood and it feels like it's being understood, then there's more openings for architects to be able to bring in their own design agendas because now you can communicate that design agenda aligned with the language and the priorities of the client. That's right. And here's the key here is that everyone has a different perception of value. And my perception of value does not equate to someone else's perception. And who am I to impose my perception of value on someone else? And I think this is the trap that architects fall into a lot is they take their own perception of what value is and this is what they're trying to sell. Or this is the ethical things that they impose in their way of doing business with their clients. So here's what Eric writes. So there was a little exchange here. And I said, um, you know, kind of talking about it was interesting to bring ethics into it. This is just negotiation. And then someone else wrote, um, you know, that he agreed with Blair here. Uh, so Eric wrote back. And he said, so you think two identical projects, hypothetically, but two different clients, one more fee savvy than the other Uh, The other rich with money to burn, maybe their first experience with an architect. I've never met anyone who's rich with money to burn. Well, sorry to interject. Let me finish Eric's thing. I don't know what clients he's talking about. But if they're rich, most likely they're even more shrewd with their money. But let's let's move on. Uh, Maybe their first experience with an architect should be subject to be charged double or more just because they trust you and you can get away with it. There are no ethics involved in that question mark. Uh, interesting. I try to be fair to each client and give them all the same level of service and the same fee structure based on what I feel my value. Here's the key. My value is to them. Perhaps I'm naive, but I sleep comfortably at night. If I were a consumer of a service and discovered someone charged me more than a friend of mine for equal service, I would never return to that professional, nor would I recommend them. I just see this as a price gouging technique just on the idea that you can get away with it. I believe ethics play a big part in this. So I guess we just don't see eye to eye on this issue. I mean, very, very interesting. And there's a lot to unpack here. I think the key is I can see where Eric's coming from. Obviously, price gouging is not a great way to run a business. I mean, you're not going to be around long if you're price gouging your customers, right? Yeah, However, you're going out of business. That's the thing. If you're not providing value and people are not happy with what you're doing, you're going out of business. Yeah, as simple you, as that. you will not last long. Um, so the interesting thing that I thought and that you brought up earlier when we were talking about this is that value is subjective and value is determined by me as the consumer of the product right? If I'm the one making the purchase, then I'm the one who's determining the value. And so what's interesting here is Eric's almost imposing his idea of value. In other words, like low fees are the part of the value I'm delivering, like a certain set number of fees. And he's imposing that on the client as if that is where they're coming from as well. But I'm not sure if I communicated that clearly enough to get the intricacy of that. Ryan, did I explain that? Say it, say it again. In a way that was clear enough? Say it again. Sure. So let me just give an example. You and I are in a business transaction. Yeah. Ryan says, Enoch, I'm going to, you know, you should choose me because I'm going to slash my fees and they're going to be low. Or you might just say, I'm going to do, you know, you should do business with me because I charge all my clients the same fees. I give you fair value for what I feel I deliver. Okay, great. So that's your value. You're trying to say, this is why I'm valuable as a provider. Now, me, as, a, as someone who's buying services, is that what I value? No, not necessarily. Well, I'll tell you that it's, it's not. 
for instance, when I go shop, I'll give an example of my car mechanic, right? When I go shopping around the car mechanics, I can have a car mechanic tell me, yep, we have a flat hourly rate. It's $35 an hour, and this is what we charge everyone. You know, we just want to be fair and make sure that we're not gouging people and stuff like that. Like, I appreciate the honesty, but that's not my highest criteria. I'm willing to pay much more if I know that it's going to be done to an excellent standard. I'm not going to have to go back again, right? This is how I view value, right? So it's more complex than just saying, that somehow I'm gouging a customer because I'm charging this customer more than another. So this is where I was talking about the idea of a negotiation, that in any business transaction, ethics do play a part um, in one sense, right? Obviously, we need to be ethical, and there's certain ethic, ethical... I mean, ultimately, ethics, I think... Well, uh, what is ethical? Again, like, there's, there's, there's rules, and again, this is going to be... You know, again, you kind of... It's, it's a fine line that the rules of ethics and ideals and standards are kind of subjective as well. And you're going to it's be... It's a social contract, right? Yeah. It's a social contract. It means that two people come together and agree on something. And if you look at it, all businesses do this. For example, I'm just thinking about a bag of sweets, like Haribo, which mm, I... I love those gummy I, bears. I sometimes have a little... A little, a little you know. Haribo. So a bag of Haribo... If you go to WH Smith in the UK at a petrol stop on the motorway, you you can end up paying two pound fifty for a little bag of a hundred grams of Haribo. If you go to another shop, maybe on the high street with a non-branded um, news agents or corner shop, what do they call them? Convenience store. That same bag of sweets may only be a pound. Now that is price gouging, Ryan. That is price gouging. <laughs> Why? You're getting you're getting me upset now. And how do they get away with it? It's- well, this see, this is an interesting conversation that price gouging in, in this this is a great example. Because in this example, it comes down to a lot of times the perception of the consumer. And it goes back to the money scripts. So for instance, if I'm on the motorway and I have to pay, you know, if if it's five dollars and I think that's out of my I think that's ridiculous, I just won't buy it. Fine. You don't have to. I don't have to. No one's forcing me to to purchase it. You don't have to, yeah. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, if I'm really craving some gummy bears and they're two fifty, and I know that's twice as what I'd pay at the the corner store back in town, I and I purchase it, it's because I really want some gummy bears (laughs) and I'm gonna be happy to pay double because that's fantastic that they even have that store there that I can have that service. Yeah, exactly. And they might and you know, and again there's I was talking to somebody else about this the other day about where value is created and how we go about creating it. And the whole world of import export is kind of based on, on that. So I was listening to a Ted talk. I can't remember the name of the guy, but it's a guy who's now a big fashion, uh, trader, big fashion, has a big fashion house. And he was talking about how he first set up his business was he was in San Francisco and he'd bought a pair of jeans from somewhere out of town. They were kind of cool looking jeans and he went into the center of town and uh, he was in a shop and the owner of the shop saw the jeans on the guy and said, where did you get those? Or like, you know, where are they? And he was like, you know, they're my, they're my jeans. So what he'd done is he'd bought these jeans from outside. He'd, I think he'd turned them inside out or did something very, very basic to them flipped them and then he was wearing them and the guy was like you know where, where did he, where'd you get them from he was like i can get you loads of them so he kept his kind of source where they were from because they weren't far away um but what he did was he went and then bought those jeans at that lower price or whatever it was did whatever customization he did to it a very simple really really simple cut or something like that and then sold them to the other guy. Now, he didn't even need, he was saying in the conversation, that he didn't even need to necessarily do any changes to them. But the fact that he was bringing value by, A, he'd found this product. He has now brought it to this guy. The guy didn't have to move. The guy didn't have to do anything. He was solving a problem of that particular client. That client, that, that shop vendor wanted to have those jeans. And he made a profit on the whole transaction because he created value for that particular vendor. Is that unethical because he took a product from somewhere else that was being 
priced at a certain price. Yeah. It's it's simple arbitrage. Yeah. You know, and I think if you listen to what Blair was saying in this podcast episode, you have to listen to the full context of what he was talking about. He wasn't saying if a client is rich, you charge them as much as you can to get money out of them. Yeah, you know, again, in business, not going to last you to do that. Right. But he did say you identify the value that you're bringing to the project, and then you make a case to the client why your fee should be reflected in the value you're delivering to them. And it's a simple, this is where my my response was, it's a simple matter of negotiation. And they don't have to use you. I mean, they don't they don't have to say that's right, you know. It's So it's interesting, and Eric's comment here is he's sort of, he's applying this, his ethical, you know, kind of blank slate to all of his clients, which is fine. But what's interesting about this is this is a mindset that I know a lot of architects share, um, it's one that I used to share more fully myself before I began to sort of experiment and understand capital a little bit better. But this idea, I think what ends up happening here is that other people who are more savvy in business end up taking advantage of architects because architects are imposing these kind of invented ethics about what value is and about how they're delivering value to their clients when it doesn't necessarily align with what their clients think the value is, you know? So, again, we come back to this idea of money scripts, right? What money is, what value is. It's it's an interesting conversation, and it's obviously not something that is simple. Yeah, and it goes deep, and it goes, and it can be, you know, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of emotion wrapped up around money. There's a lot of emotion wrapped up around money. Human beings get crazy around money. Um, we, we were doing some trainings earlier, and, and our trainer mentor was talking about how when people have to give up money to buy something or something money's on money's involved that's where kind of irrational stuff starts happening people can end up being crazy and doing bizarre things for good or for bad Uh, and we bring a lot of emotional baggage to the conversation around money and again when we start looking at what is money well, it's a kind of agreement between people and money comes from other people in exchange for something which is of value to that person. Uh, and all of that exchange and that value is created in a conversation and feeling like the other person knows that you know there's trust in the relationship for that exchange to happen. And you are there, they are there by their own free will and they can take it or leave it essentially so it is it is really really fascinating if our, we're as an industry we are engaging in this conversation of well, what is value we've got to start peeling it back and really looking at you know how is value created how does the rest of the capitalist world um do it and we can either get onto a really high horse and be like capitalism is bad and we need a total rethink of society and okay fine it's not going to happen in our lifetimes un- most likely um but there is a system there that we can learn how it operates and you know we can mitigate our own human greed towards things and create whatever you want to create essentially it's it's an open field and what i would say to our to our listeners is don't conflate your desires for social justice and social good with your business practices now that may sound horribly capitalistic and horribly mean but here's the problem let me give you an example i was speaking with an architect and she was saying yeah when i first started out my practice i was talking to my accountant and he looked at my books and says my goodness do you realize you're running a nonprofit here and she kind of laughed and she said yeah well that's true he's all well no seriously why don't you incorporate as a nonprofit if you're going to run like a nonprofit <laughs> because with a nonprofit you don't have to pay income tax you don't pay taxes and so what was happening is that, like, if you want to run as a non, if you want to be a nonprofit, like, if this is your social goal to like not really make money, just to make a salary, to provide services for whatever social justice that you want to do, which is fantastic and that's great. If you want to make that your business model, make it your business model. This is what I'm saying, right? So that, like, it's like a lot of times I see architects. It's almost as if we have our our both of our feet in like both camps, mm-hmm. where we want to be the nonprofit, we want to be the one who's kind of helping people out and saving the world, but at the same time we're trying to run a business, right? 
that's not as that's that's a very tough model. It's not a successful model, right? Ultimately, what's going to happen? Well, ultimately, what what would be the better thing to do is if that's if you want to do a nonprofit model, be a nonprofit, start a public interest sort of design community center. You know, get donations for your services or just charge minimum fees and run as a nonprofit. Fantastic. You have tax savings, and then you're clear about your vision about what you actually want. Right. On the other hand, if you also want to make some money, you don't want to be a nonprofit, then make money, make enough to make 20% profit and then give back by devoting, say, 10% of your time to pro bono. But be intentional about it. Here's the thing is that I fear that someone like Eric is is not understanding or maybe not thinking through all the ramifications of his choices in terms of not only how it affects his clients, but how it affects his business, how it affects his ability to make impact through his architecture. And I may be completely wrong about that. I'm sure. I'm sure he feels he is intentional because this was a very intentional comment, mm-hmm. right? That he says here. I may perhaps I'm naive, but I sleep comfortably at night. If I were, it's this is a very black and white comment. You know, like oh, if you price, if you do variable price, and then you must be a charlatan, and you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I mean, this is a very. So again, we go back to that comment from John. Very, very black and white. It's very interesting the approach that these two architects that commented. Um, and how they see value. And this is something that I haven't, that I've heard frequently mm. um, in the architecture industry. And I think it goes back to kind of that that architect mindset. You know, so he says, I, I just see this as a price gouging technique just on the idea that you can get away with it. You know, he says, um, if I found out that someone had charged, if I were a consumer of a service and discovered someone charged me more than a friend of mine for equal service, I would never refer to that professional would I recommend them. Well, here's the thing. Blair's not talking about equal service because he's talking about greater value. Yeah, so it's different. It is different. It's different. It's, it's a different proposition for each person. If, is, if this someone is, this comes, if, yeah, if I find out that someone had charged me double what they charged Ryan, but I got an excellent result, and in terms of the fees that I paid and the value that I got, I'm super happy that I did it. If I find out Ryan got it for half, how is that relevant to me? Right? It's just a different way of looking at this value exchange. Yeah. And so I guess, Ryan, it feels like at least what I'm saying is that a lot of times we try to put our own perception of value on the world instead of perceiving that there's yeah, different we ways. Don't, of- we, don't, we don't understand how, you know, partic- we know this when in sales conversations like when something is important to somebody else and you're providing a solution to that exact thing, then it's really valuable to that person. And they're paying for you because they know that you can deliver the result for that particular problem. And sometimes another person just doesn't understand what the problem is. They don't know, they don't understand that exact thing that you're trying to get done. Well, here's, here's another interesting thing, Ryan, is that people actually, it's proven through studies that people value things they pay more for. So who's to say that I didn't get more value because I paid more? Yeah. And this is actually what happens psychologically. If you look at the economics and psychology of pricing, oftentimes, like people that buy a Rolls Royce, well, here's a great example, two cars, right? Someone went and bought a Ferrari that cost a million, you know, half a million dollars. I know a guy that there's a million, you get the old Ferrari, what is the F40? Yeah. Those really cool ones from the 80s. Yeah. Like those go for a million dollars right now. Right, but I bought my Honda for for fifteen thousand dollars. Ryan, I got it's the same thing, right? It gets me from point A to point B. Right, it takes me from here to there. Yeah, it's just a car. Well, this see, this is a two dimensional kind of view on value, and it's really interesting, particularly with these kinds of objects and these industry in this industry. Like and luxury items are really fascinating to look at. At well, where is the value coming from? Although people that are making and selling them understand and have built a brand which is creating value for the consumers. Some people like to tell their friends at a dinner party that they they hired a very expensive architect, or I paid this much. You know, there's there's like you said, there's a certain Status. psychological or. Um, kind of intrinsic value that people get out of spending lots of money, right, on something. It can be it can be status. There's other ways that people get value out of this. And so to say, Eric, to say that your measure of value, which is fees, that that alone is the determination of the value that your client is getting and whatever architecture you provide, 
is a very one-dimensional view of business, of capital, of value, of how people perceive value. Again, because there's intrinsic and uh, extrinsic rewards that people get. You know, intrinsic would be just the utility of something. So, for instance, I have a glass here. The intrinsic value of this thing is that it holds water and that I can drink out of it. That's for our podcast listeners, right? So that's the intrinsic value. It's just the utility of this. Now, if you're in architecture and you're selling utility, you're going to be a commoditized practice. You will be a commoditized because I can go down to the corner store and I can buy a 10 cent or 10 pence cup like this. However, if you tell me that this was created by an Italian artist, or maybe this is the very cup that Jesus Christ did the Holy Supper out of, <laughs> yeah, you know, suddenly yeah. this thing, the intrinsic value, sure, it looks just like that other cup, but no, this was the very one that Jesus did the Holy Supper with. You know, then we have knights errant have been searching for this. You drink this elixir, Ryan, you will get the key of life. You will be endlessly young. You know, ridiculous example. But let's say that this was this was the very cup that they use in a famous movie scene. Right now we start to add the extrinsic value. This means that there are other external factors that are influencing the value of this particular thing. Yeah, I, I, it's really fascinating. The other day I saw... Uh, Kurt Cobain's cardigan from when he played his final gig at the uh, you know Nirvana Unplugged, which is kind of sort of hello, like, uh, hello, la, la, la. exactly right. That, that, this Kurt iconic, Cobain. this iconic vision of Kurt Cobain in this kind of tatty, disgusting, you know, cigarette burnt uh, cardigan sold for like three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. And so that art collector could have said, who am I to sell this cardigan when someone could buy it down at the thrift store for five pence? Who am I to sell it for whatever it went for? Right. However, would that be robbing the person who now has a feeling of satisfaction and joy that they now possess Kurt Cobain's cardigan? Mm. I mean, not for me, but... Someone out there paid a whole lot of money. How much money did you say they paid? Three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Three hundred and twenty thousand. And I think previously it sold maybe a few years ago for one hundred twenty thousand dollars or something like this. And it was interesting. Cause it was I saw it on, on uh, LinkedIn and everybody was commenting. A lot of people were commenting underneath it. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. People are spending this money on this cardigan. Uh, that money could have gone to charity. That's that. That's always the kind of immediate, you know, slam. Okay, that money could have gone could have gone to charity. Ridiculous, conspicuous consumption. I, yeah, exactly. This why why this is this is disgusting. This is a disgusting view of how the world hmm. is operating when people are spending this amount of money onto a cardigan. Well, we don't know the context of the cardigan. The, well, the, clearly the cardigan will go up in value and has become something and is of a lot of value to particular people. And for some people, we don't you know who are we to judge where you spend £320,000. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? It comes know. down to judgment, right? Yeah. What we're talking here is you're a just, conversation you're about... Just judge, you're just judging someone for purchasing that cardigan. Yeah. When I don't know what, what their moral standings are. I don't know how much money they donate to charity. And who am I to make a judgment about how much money they give or don't give? I can only be responsible for myself and how much I'm contributing and how, effectively I, how effective I am at doing that. So it's... It's it's loaded. It's yes, interesting. It, so I guess it's interesting. It, it's interesting where this conversation's gone, and I'm glad that Eric put his thoughts here on my on my LinkedIn feed. If anyone wants to send us hate mail, we would love to feature you in an upcoming episode of the podcast. So <laughs> please send in all of your ideas about how we are just just horrible scum of the earth, and everything we say <laughs> is garbage and trash. Feel free. We would love that. And you'll get some infamy because we'll talk about you right here on the podcast. Love it. Yeah. So this this idea that value is multifaceted. I mean, that's what I'm taking away from here. It's been sort of crystallizing my own thoughts is that value is really, it's it's not as black and white as Erica's make it out to be here. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I think that the interest and the wonder of business as well is the ability to be able to see something from as many different perspectives and viewpoints as well as you can and that's kind of starting to understand how value is created um and for you to be able to navigate and understand people's perspectives is you know that's a very important human skill to be able to to do it makes life a lot richer 
and particularly when you can understand and validate it doesn't mean you need to agree with or condone but you can validate the perception of somebody else who has a very different viewpoint to yours because when we're able to do that then different new conversations can arise and a lot of things can move forward and this is i think something that will help architecture move forward the profession architects as they continue to apply the wonderful design thinking that they have to architecture to their business and that's a wrap if you haven't already make sure you get access to my free video course that reveals the roadmap to building a practice that is dependable rewarding delivers an exceptional experience for you your staff and clients is autonomous meaning that it can run without your constant input and last but not least has a powerful mission and purpose Go to dreampracticewebinar.com to access this free video course. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.